Our text for this particular series is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Just the first few words of this verse for a text and a subject. Fight the good fight of faith. That's the only fight that the Christians called on to participate in, the fight of faith. If there is a fight to faith, then there are naturally enemies to faith or hindrances to faith, or else there wouldn't be any fight. We remember that Romans chapter 10 verse 17 said, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So a lack of knowledge of God's Word is the greatest hindrance of faith that there is. Naturally, if faith comes by hearing the Word of God, as Romans 10, 17 says, then it follows that a lack of understanding of God's Word will certainly produce a lack of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now often we hear Christians praying for faith, and they really are not dealing with the problem correctly, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It's knowledge that we need, a knowledge of the Word of God. And if we receive knowledge, we will have faith. If we don't receive knowledge, We won't ever have faith because that's the way it comes is by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our faith grows with our understanding of God's Word. First of all, understanding the new birth, understanding our redemption, understanding our righteousness, understanding our place in Him and His place in our lives, understanding how to act upon God's Word, understanding our right to the use of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, understanding what the Word of God is talking about when it said, let us hold fast to our confession. Now, a lack of understanding of what the new birth really means and what it is will hinder faith. We remember that 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Everybody say, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. The text went on to say, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I've heard people say, and I suppose you have too, Well, I lived such a terrible life before I was saved. I'm just sure you know that the Lord wouldn't do anything for me. For instance, they may need healing for their body. And sometimes uh, there's the need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and so on. But you see, the Word of God teaches us that we are made new creatures. You're not that same old creature you were. We are made new creatures in Christ. And that old things have passed away. And that all things have become new. God looks upon the sinner when he comes to Jesus and when he's born again, when he's made a new creature in Christ, God looks upon him as though he had never done anything wrong. He looks upon him as though he had never sinned. You remember Isaiah 43, 25, where God said, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sin." You see, we need to look at things the way God looks at things, not the way man looks at it. With God, not only is the sinner's past, that is their sins, remitted and brought it out, but all that that sinner ever was is gone, brought it out in the sight of God, and he's become a new creature. Glory to God. And in God's sight, he is a new creature, or as the margin said, a new creature creation. Hallelujah. And that's how the believer needs to look at it. Glory to God. I I remember a number of years ago, I was holding a meeting in, well, to be exact, in the month of September 1953 in Waco, Texas. 
So I was driving home because I'd, uh, the way goes about 100 miles south of Dallas, and we lived in Garland, suburb of Dallas. So after a Friday night service, I'd drive home and uh, then be there on Saturday. We had no Saturday service. We'd drive back Sunday afternoon. But this was a Sunday night program. We had closed the revival meeting. We'd been there four weeks. And on Sunday night, I drove. And I was driving along, dialing along on the radio, trying to find something that was interesting enough to listen to. And uh, I picked up a station because it's late at night. I picked up a Chicago station. And I don't know who the minister was. I don't know his church. Because you see, well, he was preaching when I got into it. And when he went off, they ran over. And evidently, it must have been a, I, well, of course, I guess it was a reproduction because it's late. But anyway, they never stated anything. They just went right on to another program. Nonetheless, in the course of his message, this minister was pastor of a church, evidently, I gathered from what he said, because he said, our church maintain, has maintained for several years a mission down on Skid Row. And we include in our church budget every year several thousands of dollars to help the mission stay open and keep it going. Well, some folks in the church couldn't see, he said, the necessity of appropriating these thousands of dollars each year from their church budget or including it in their church budget to keep the mission going. So he said on one Sunday night, before they were to uh, have their f church budget and present it for the coming year, I had a gentleman to come from the mission who had been saved who had been gloriously born again, become a new creature in Christ. I had him to come on a Sunday night and give his testimony to the church. The man was about 67 years of age, and he, the pastor went on to, to relate his testimony in his sermon. He said uh, the man gave his testimony, and I said to him now, you go into some detail, because the people here in the church don't realize what's happening out here in the world a lot of times. And, and they live protected lives. And he said, uh, as, as far as possible, go into detail, even among some of the more uh, lurid areas of life as you could in a mixed congregation. So here was the man's testimony. 67 years of age at the time. He was three years before he'd been born again and then had continued to work in the mission for the last three years. But here was his testimony, because see, people think a lot of time that those folks sometimes down on Skid Row come sort of from the lower strata of life, so on. But this man said at 30 years of age, I was a practicing attorney here in the city of Chicago. He was a member, and he mentioned a certain firm, lawyer firm that he was associated with, and just simply had a, a lovely home and wife and a 12-year-old daughter. Uh, or, uh, or actually the daughter at that time wasn't 12 years of age. At that time she was eight years of age. And he had uh, several automobiles parked in the driveway and, and a beautiful home. But he said, I began to drink socially and I was just sure I could handle it. But he, at 34 years of age, he wound up an alcoholic. He couldn't handle it. And the law firm you know, they lost customers because of him, and finally they just had to exclude him, put him out of the law firm. And so he said his wife couldn't live with him any longer. He lost his home, he lost his cars, he lost his money, and his wife, and at that time then, four years later, 12-year-old daughter left. And he said for 30 years, now think about that, from 34 to 64, there he was down on Skid Row, just living, you know, out of the garbage can, so to speak. Uh, an alcoholic bumming a dollar here, a dime or a quarter, whatever he can to get another drink. And he'd go particularly in the wintertime, you know, because it's cold out there on the streets and it can get cold in Chicago. And he'd go to the mission, you see, and they would furnish a bed and give him a warm meal. But he said the time came when uh, they made the uh, rule that you didn't eat until after you had attended a service before they just fed him, you see. And so he said, well, he's hungry, you know, you get hungry enough, you do anything. So he slipped into the service, the chapel service, sat down on the back seat, thinking about, you know, the nice warm soup that he's gonna get here directly. But through the preaching of the word, God got a hold of him. And when they gave an altar call, he said, I went to the altar and I was born again. And I became a new creature in Christ Jesus, praise God. 
And then he had worked there, just continued to stay on and work for those three years and had one more alcoholic than anybody else. Amen, because he understood them and he had been where they were, you see. And then he went on, uh, the pastor said, that he went into some detail as far as he could with a mixed congregation to some of the things that they had practiced in sin and so on and so forth. And so he said uh, that the man on the front seat of the church, there sat a beautiful little 13-year-old girl, blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl. Her mother and daddy were members of the church. She had been brought up in the church, but she had never made a commitment to Christ. And so he said, this man suddenly stopped in telling some of these things and said, now, I'm not proud of any of these things, but the pastor asked me to relate some of them to you. Uh, things that he had done and things that had transpired and happened in sin. And I'm not proud of it at all, but I am glad that God delivered me and saved me. And then he said, he pointed to this little girl sitting there. And he said, I'd give anything in the world if I was as clean and as innocent and as pure as that little girl. The pastor said, I spoke up and said, you're cleaner, you're purer than she is if she hasn't been born again. That was the point he was making in his sermon, you see. Amen. If she hasn't been born again, you're cleaner, you're purer than she is. Because, you see, did you ever stop to think about it? That pastor spoke a truth. I mean, we sing it, but I don't think we believe it. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Evangel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all, all their guilty stain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Can you say amen? You see, very often we as humans look at things from the natural standpoint. But God doesn't look at things from the natural standpoint. We know that from reading the Bible. We know that from the 55th chapter of Isaiah. Remember there in the 55th chapter of Isaiah, God said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. And the word of God contains God's thinking. Hallelujah. God looks at things from a spiritual standpoint and in the sight of God, Spiritual sins are worse than physical sins. Now, however, you can't see spiritual sins necessarily. We see people do things outwardly and commit a physical sin, and we say, oh, that's terrible. Well, it may be. Yet, on the other hand, people can have things on the inside of them that are worse than that. I remember one time when Jesus appeared to me in one of the visions, he said to me, I'll judge people quicker on spiritual sins than I will physical sins. Well, you say, what are, what do you mean spiritual sins? Well, I'll just talk a little bit about it. You can't go into all of it. But for instance, you know, you can do the right thing with the wrong motive and that's a spiritual sin. You could preach a sermon with the wrong motive and get a demerit instead of getting a plus. You can sing a song with the wrong motive, but I, you can't see the motive that's behind the action. In the same way with attitude, and the same way with a lot of things. And so uh, we know as Christians that practice in witchcraft and such things are wrong and of the devil. We know that evil spirits are involved. But you know, the Bible said in 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter and the 23rd verse, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And you know, you can't always tell when people rebel. They can rebel on the inside and on the outside look all right. They may be like the little boy, you know, they tell about that was naughty in school. And the teacher made him stand up in the corner. And he said to somebody, I'm standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. He was rebelling all the time. God sees the inside. Rebellion, God said, is as a sin of witchcraft. And even Christians rebel sometimes. They rebel against God's plan. They rebel against God's word. 
they rebelled against God. And you can't see rebellion always. Sometimes you see the results of it. Yet the Bible says that rebellion is as witchcraft. And then, as I said, we look at the outward side a lot of times to judge. Remember, I was holding a meeting one time in a certain place. And, uh, uh, well, the, the meeting was just, you know, wasn't running too well. Not as well as it should. It's sort of almost a drag. And, uh, but one night, right in the middle of Wednesday night of the second week, we ran the meeting three weeks all together. And right in the middle of the second week, God just moved in an unusual way. And there was a man that was mightily used of God in gifts of the Spirit manifested through him. Some very spectacular supernatural things happened. And I remember I was standing in the pulpit and I thought to myself, in fact, I said to myself, this is the turning point. I mean, this meeting will be different. It's been sort of a little draggy, but, and I'll tell you, that was true. From then on, I mean, it just took off like a jet plane. <laughs> Amen. But I remember I was by myself on that meeting. I went back to my place and I got to bed and I listened to the news on the television, turned it off and prayed a little and tried to go to sleep. But there's something nagging me, you know. You know how it is sometimes. And finally, I just sat up in bed and turned the light on. And I said, all right, Lord, let's just have this out. <laughs> now, I know. I know that that man was used of God. I know that's the Holy Ghost that was manifested through him. Gifts of the Spirit and some spectacular supernatural things happened that blessed the whole congregation. But I happened to be driving. I had a morning service, a night service, but I haven't been driving down one of the streets of the city just, uh, I believe, the day before, if I'm not mistaken, maybe that day, but anyway, the last day or two. And I saw that fellow go into a certain place that's not just exactly right. But see, you can judge wrong. He could have business there. He may went in to collect a bill. Uh, are, you, are you following me? Amen. Amen. But anyway, I saw him and, and, and judged the thing. You know, well, that guy, you know, I saw him in the meeting. He's, he's going into that place, you know. I drove on down the street. And I said to the Lord, Lord, now how come you to use him? Now they've said, you know, I'd been there a week and a half and here's this wonderful lady because I went out to eat with the pastor and his wife and they talked about this marvelous lady in the church, 80 years of age, a little better. Been a Christian spirit filled for about 60 years and just to live such a holy. Now why couldn't you have used her? And the Lord said, the trouble with you is you don't believe your own preaching. I'll tell you, I felt like somebody hit me in the stomach with their fist, you know. I grabbed myself like that and said, Lord, you hit me a little bit. What do you mean? I, I don't believe my own preaching. I sure do. No, he said, you don't. You don't even believe it and don't even practice it. You know, most Christians and preachers don't. I said, no, most Christians and preachers don't. Don't shout me down. I call them preaching real good. Now, don't forget that story because I'm coming back to it. I want to tell you another one. I was holding a meeting for a pastor a number of years ago, to be more explicit, in the month of May of 1952, right here in the state of Oklahoma. And so he was telling me, as we were talking, he was telling me about something that happened to him a year or two before when he was an associate pastor, assistant pastor at another church. And this church was supporting a lady missionary out among the Navajo Indians. And so the church made up things, you know. People brought in good clothes, not just a bunch of junk. And they got to, brought groceries. And, and so he took, you know, all of the, in fact, pulled a trailer behind his car. And his trunk's full. The back seat of the car is full. Just enough clothes for him and his wife because they're going to have a, a week's meeting out there in the mission station in Arizona, Navajo Indian Reservation. So they took these things out. He preached a week. And he said in, that, uh, in the mission there, there's a great big old... The Indian actually said he is, he's a big one. He's about almost six foot six inches tall. And he was just on fire for God. Man, that guy was on fire for God. And, and the, the missionary was a lady missionary and said she told him this story that this, uh, this particular Indian, his wife had gotten saved. He wasn't saved. He had never come to church unless he was drinking. But he had begun to drink and he had come to church 
But then he'd tear up everything. He'd get right up in the middle of the sermon, start breaking up the pews, come up and get the pulpit and just tear it apart. <laughs> get the altar bench and pull it apart. Just, just, and said he'd go on these rampages and the, the uh, reservation police couldn't handle him. They'd have to get four or five squad cars from the sheriff's department out of Flagstaff to come out and corral the fella. He's a one-man gang. <laughs> and so she said one night, she's a preaching, and, and he showed up. She had already gotten the pulpit before he came in and said it was just fear gripped her because he didn't know what in the world he's going to do. And as see, we're talking about prior to 1952. Many of them have received a better education since then, but said you had to talk very simply because they had very little, if any, education. And so I took a simple text, you know, you're acquainted with it from Romans, the 10th chapter and the 13th verse, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I took that from my text. And just preach a little sermonette, you know, like you was talking almost to children, church. Very simple. And she said, I'm still talking, been talking about 15 minutes, when suddenly I, I knew this Indian must be drunk, he wouldn't be out there. He got up and started down the aisle. I thought, dear Lord, here he comes. He's going to break up the furniture. But instead of breaking anything up, he fell across the altar. And he said, Jesus, 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 four times. Well, we was all so stunned to see him in the altar. Nobody moved. <laughs> and then it suddenly dawned on us. She said that there he is. And there's this, this one-man gang. Here's this man that's worse than anybody in the altar. We better get down there and pray with him. <laughs> so we got down there with him. About the time we got there, he got up. You know, and as we say, speaking naturally, she said, my feathers fell. You know what you mean to that? <laughs> He's not going to get saved. And so said, uh, uh, you know, get back down here. This pray. He said, there's no use of praying. I'm saved. <laughs> no, but see, they know how mean he's been. Yeah, but you, you better, you, you're going to have to do a lot of praying. <laughs> well, all of your praying is not going to atone for your sin. But they know how mean he's been, you see. You better get back down there and pray. He said, there's no need. I'm already saved. Yeah, but you need to pray some more. No, I don't. He said, I'm saved. Thank God Jesus saved me. He said, I don't know. I can't read, but I just heard you preaching. Said, you said, whosoever called on the name of the Lord will be saved. Said, didn't you hear me? I called on him four times. Amen. He believed it. Didn't you hear me? He said, I called on him four times. You said, whoever called on the name of the Lord will be saved. This missionary said, didn't even believe my own preaching. <laughs> you know, that's so too many times. And, and here he was. This pastor said, one of the greatest workers of ever just on fire. He'd won any number of alcoholics to the Lord because he's an alcoholic himself. He'd won more people to the Lord than all the rest of the church put together. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the Lord, back to my story now. You remember, don't you? The Lord said, the trouble with you is you don't believe your own preaching. Well, I said, Lord, you've hit me a low blow. You know I believe the word. Sure, I believe it. I preach the word and I believe it. He said, no, you don't. He said, every now and then you'll quote. I said, I've already quoted here. Where I said in my word, I even I am he that brought out thy transgressions and I'll not remember thine iniquities. He said, now you talk about that fellow. You saw him. You don't know why he went into the building. Have no knowledge of it whatsoever. And you just drove on by and imagined he's in there, you know, to do something wrong. And he didn't go in there to do anything wrong anyway. And when he saw, you know, that uh, he's in this environment, he said, Lord, I don't have any been here. Forgive me. And turned around and walked out. He said, I didn't remember that he did anything wrong. And then you said, that's the reason I could use him. Can you see that? But he said, now this lady you was talking about, why didn't I use her? He said, sure, she's been in church from the outside faithful all of these years. But you can't see into her heart, and you didn't know that for the past 40 years that she's been in rebellion toward me. You see, the Lord does not look at outward appearance. We do so many times. We ought to know that from the story of the Old Testament. Don't you remember Samuel? God sent him down there to anoint one of Jesse's boys to be king of Israel. You remember that? And here's the prophet of God, the man of God. And so he got down there and, and the Lord sent me down here to anoint one of the boys to be king in Saul's stead for God's rejected Saul. 
And, and so they ran the oldest boy out first, Eliab. Here he came, and he was of a beautiful countenance and a fine physique. And even the man of God thought, surely, surely this must be the Lord's anointed. I mean, he must have had such a stately stature about him. The Lord said, no, he's not the one. said, I don't look on the outward appearance. I look on the heart. Amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. And so, that's the trouble with a lot of folks, you see. Instead of going the way the Bible says and doing what the Bible said to do, they're looking on outward appearances. They see something on the outside that of man sometimes which they think is not just exactly right. And so they're sure, you know, that God couldn't possibly use him. But sometimes, notice what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 27 about those Jesus spoke of concerning the outside, said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are likened unto whitened sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward." but are within a full of dead men's bones. You see, you can't see. That's what the Lord said to me about that dear woman, seemed to be such a wonderful and faithful Christian. He said, that woman has been rebellious in her spirit for over 40 years. I see that rebellion. He said, it comes up before me dark and black and mean and ugly. But yet, you see, all the saints look at the outside and brag on and say, isn't that wonderful? What a marvelous saint she is. What a marvelous Christian she is. But it's entirely possible for folks on the outside to be beautiful and on the inside, as Jesus said, to be like dead men's bones. Did you ever stop to think about it? Those Pharisees were really, the you would say, the best. They were the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. They lived the best lives. Amen? That's why the Bible said in Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged, because you can't judge really spiritual judgment. Amen? We cannot judge, in other words, righteous judgment. It's impossible. Amen. Now, you see, the minister that I referred to there in, uh, in Chicago understood this when he said to the redeemed alcoholic, in the sight of God, in the sight of God, you are cleaner and pure and more innocent than that young girl if she hasn't been born again. Amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. Our text said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now notice, all things have become new. Now listen real carefully what I say and don't misinterpret it. Don't take it out of context. Oh, that's what happens with so many people. I wonder sometimes whether they're just ignorant or, or dishonest. Because you can take out of context what anybody says and make them say something they didn't say. You can take scripture out of context and make the Bible say something that it didn't say. Now notice, all things have become new. There are no sin scars left on the Christian. Now, I did not say there may not be sin scars left on the body. But the body is not you. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I keep under my body, Paul says, I bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, I keep my body under, I bring it, he calls his body it. The body is the house you live in. Now because of the sins of the past, there may be sin scars left on the body, but there are no sin scars left on you. Hallelujah. God is looking at the new man in Christ when he looks at you. And you know, we look a whole lot better in Christ than we do out of him. We can't see each other in Christ. 
We look at each other from the natural standpoint. But God looks at us in Him. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now while we're on that, before we go further in our discussion, I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians. I want to look at a verse of Scripture. That's a very controversial and bring much comment from a lot of folks. Where God said, writing through the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus, in the 25th and 26th verses, he said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now notice, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, that is Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he, Christ Jesus, might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, without reading that in card context, take this 27th verse, said, see, this church should be without spot. I'm looking, I can see a lot of spots. And it should be without wrinkle, and I can see that you're full of wrinkles. And that it should be uh, holy and without blemish. And I can sure see that you're not holy, and I can sure see a lot of blemishes about you. For one thing, your nose is too big. <laughs> but now wait just a minute. That's not what it's talking about at all. You're looking at it from the natural standpoint. We're not ready for the coming of Jesus. Folks say, we're going to have to clean up. Uh, well, if you could have cleaned up, you could have saved yourself. No, notice, it's Jesus that's going to do it. Amen. Not you. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he, Christ, might sanctify it. Glory to God. And cleanse it. How does he do it? With the washing of water by the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That he might present it. He's going to do it. Not you. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Hallelujah. You know, I know. I'm not perfect. I wonder about you. But I'll tell you, I'm so glad that God don't see me the way you do. I'm glad that he sees me in Christ. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. That he might present it. Not that we'll present ourselves. Well, that's the reason we're going to have to go through the tribulation, some folks said. So the tribulation will purify us. My Bible says that he's going to do it. Jesus is, not tribulation. Amen. 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 Jesus is going to do it. Present it to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle in such thing, but should be holding without blemish. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But you see, a lack of understanding of our place in him and his place in us often hinders us, keeps us from success, throttles our faith, and is the reason for unbelief. People often ask me, I've had them through the years to ask me about studying the Bible how to study the Bible. So, and I have many suggestions, but there's one above all others that I always suggest. And I want to present it to you. Amen, as I have in time past. As a believer, as a Christian, may I suggest to you to follow this method as you go through the New Testament. Primarily the epistles. First of all, live in the epistles. Now why? Because those are the letters that are written to you. One could never be a successful Christian and live in the four Gospels. If you only read the four Gospels and just lived in them, then you wouldn't even know why Jesus came. Now you think you would, because you've already read the epistles and know why he came. But do you think that you'd know more if you hadn't read the rest of it, that you'd know more than the apostles did that walked with Jesus for three and a half years almost? They were right with him every day for over three years. And they didn't know why he died. 
See, you do because you read the epistles. But you don't know why he died by reading the gospels. The four gospels have to do with his life, with his burial, with his death, with his resurrection. But in the letters written to the church, they tell us exactly why he died. Hallelujah. Now look at Galatians, the first chapter, the 11th verse. Paul said, writing to the churches in Galatia, the gospel, 11th verse, which was preached to me is not after man. Verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now in the four gospels, you see him on the cross. You see him die. You see him buried. You see him raised again. But in the epistles, you find out what happened the moment he died, where he went and what he did. You also find out what happened to him after he was raised from the dead. The first thing that he did before he permitted folks to touch him, because you remember when Mary continued, Peter and John went away and Mary stayed there, and Jesus appeared to her. And he said, touch me not. Touch me not. Now why? Luke 24, 39 put it this way. He said, touch me not. We'll get to this verse in a minute. First there in John, he said, touch me not. Now why? I've not yet ascended. I've not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. But in Luke 24, 39 now, when he appeared to the disciples, he said, handle me. In other words, touch me, handle me, and see. They thought it was a spirit, a ghost that appeared to them. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now, why would he say to Mary, the first person that saw him, don't touch me? And a little later on, the same day, at evening, the same day, he appeared to the disciples and said, touch me, handle me or touch me, so you can see I'm flesh and bone. Well, thank God for the epistles. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's in the epistles written to the Hebrew Christians that we find out what happened between these two appearances. When he appeared to Mary and said, don't touch me. When he appeared to the disciples and said, touch me. The word of God says in the book of Hebrews that he entered into the heavenly holies of holies. Once and for all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once and for all. The book of Hebrews said he entered in with his own blood. Once and for all. To obtain an eternal redemption for us. He did it once and for all. Don't have to be done again. Don't have to be done again. He entered in to the heavenly holies of holies with his own blood to obtain an eternal redemption for us. Now that's the reason I take umbrage to anybody that appear, with blood appears on the hands. It's not the blood of Jesus. I said it's not the blood of Jesus. He entered in with his blood once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for all. Well, somebody said, that's a sign to you, though. I don't need any sign. I've got his word for it. Yeah. Don't need that sign. That's right. And you find no such signs corroborated by the scriptures. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's the reason I take umbrage with those dear ones, bless their darling hearts, that's gotten over into witchcraft and evil spirits and don't know it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And by, by some of their own record, I've read them for years, nothing new. And the, the, the sign, they say, of the, their, their hands being pierced. Like one person said, a dark image appeared and thrust a spear in their side. You don't have to have any spear thrust in your side. It's unscriptural. I said, it's unscriptural. No. Jesus entered in once and for all with his own blood to obtain an eternal redemption for us. Hallelujah. 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless God both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, I just wanted to make that point (laughs) to encourage you as a Christian, as a believer. And I'll tell you, if those dear ones had spent their time in the epistles, they'd have known, praise God, what's bought and paid for and done and belongs to you. I didn't say you wasn't supposed to read the Bible elsewhere. I didn't say you wasn't supposed to study the Old Testament. I said, don't spend most of your time there. Now, within the last year, I've read the whole Bible through once, Psalms and Proverbs through twice, and the New Testament through twice. But just reading, just reading, you need to do more than just read. But you'll find, you can look at this Bible, you can see it's always more worn in these letters written to the epistles. That's where I study. That's where I live. Praise God forevermore. Now then, I made reference to the fact that here's one way to study. I made reference to it before that years ago, 1933, when I was on the bed of sickness and I spent 16 months bed fast, I heard a Methodist minister on the radio say from Dallas, KRLD, in those days Radio Revival was on, Brother W.E. Hawkins. And he said it would pay any Christian and every Christian to go through the New Testament, primarily the epistles, and underline with a red pencil or else write out every one of the scriptures in Christ, in whom, and in him. And then he said, begin to confess that's who I am and what I have. Well, you will find it's over 140 such verses altogether in the Bible, New Testament, most of them in the epistles. Now, however, some of them just make mention in Christ and doesn't really tell you anything you have. For instance, Paul writing a letter said, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's an expression in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's just a greeting. It doesn't tell you anything that's yours because you're in Christ. There are close to 130 of the expressions throughout the epistles which do tell you something that you have because you're in Christ, or they at least infer what you are because you're in Him, in whom, and in Christ. Now, for instance, the scripture that we've been looking at, let's look at it again briefly. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Find all of these scriptures. When you find them, write them down. Meditate on them. Begin to confess them. Now, what do you mean confess them? I just mean to begin to say with your mouth, this is who I am. This is what I am, and this is what I have in Christ. Now, it may not seem real to you to begin with, but the more you confess it, the more real it will become. Now, as far as God is concerned, just look at things again from God's standpoint. As far as God is concerned, you have, everything you have are All that he's done in Christ belongs to you. It's already done. It's already bought. It's already paid for. But you want it to become real in your life. Now, for instance, Ephesians, the first chapter, the third verse said, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Not not who's going to. But hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. All that they are in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. I've had people to say to me, wonderful people, born again. Brother Hagin, I'm born again. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I know I'm saved. I speak with other tongues. But you know, I read those scriptures that you gave. They they just don't seem real to me. And yet the Word of God tells me that it belongs to me. What am I going to do? Well, instead of going around talking that don't seem real to you, just confess to yourself and to the devil, praise God, that's who I am. That's what I have. And you'll find you'll rise to the level of that place. Amen. 
You know, we talk about walking by faith. Well, our text said, fight the good fight of faith. You accept the Word of God and believe God for what it says. Now say it out loud, everybody. I am, I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now you'll find the more you'll confess that, the more real it will become to you. And as I've said many times, there are many in Christ scriptures. I love all of them. But maybe because I found that one first, that's, uh, that's my favorite in Christ scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now then, there are a number of favorite in him scriptures. Number of them in the Bible. But let me give you my favorite in him scriptures. You'll find it right there in that same fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Skip down to the 21st verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Him who knew no sin. Well, that was Jesus, wasn't it? Was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In him. In him. Hallelujah. And then here's an in whom scripture. The Bible says in whom, in whom we have our redemption. Several different times Paul uses that expression. For instance, here again in the writing to the Ephesians, you remember. We just simply notice that verse. We'll look at it again. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heaven and places in Christ. Verse 3 of the first chapter. Now skip down to the seventh verse of the same opening. In whom, see that's an in whom verse. In whom we have. Not we're going to get it in the sweet by and by when we get to heaven. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness or the remission of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now, for instance, we see and know from the Bible that God has provided the new birth. He's provided salvation for us. We see the way that salvation becomes real to us. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confessions made unto salvation. Hallelujah. Well, the same thing's true concerning these other verses. How are they going to become real in your life? By you beginning to confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that what God's word says is true. You see, when you believe a thing with your heart and confess it with your mouth, then it becomes real to you. Faith's confessions creates realities. And so as you read some of these scriptures in Christ, in whom and in him, sometimes they won't seem real to you. You said, well, boy, I wish that was so concerning me. The Bible said it is so. Don't take a stand against God and against his word. Side in with him. It may not seem like it's real, but where did you ever read in the scripture where it said we walk by seems like? <laughs> the Bible said we walk by faith. Amen. Amen, and not by sight. Amen. In other words, because you believe the word of God in your heart began to say this is mine. This is who I am. This is what I have. And the more you say it, the more real it will become to you. Till after a while, you'll begin to wonder why you ever were like you were before. Amen. Because you'll take your place in God, in Christ, in whom, and in Him. Amen. Amen. It's believing God's Word and confessing God's Word that creates a reality of it in your life. Now, did you ever stop to think about it? We've all read and look at it and quote it and thank God for it. Matthew, the 8th chapter and the 17th verse, where it said himself, Jesus took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. See, he's already done that. Then we read 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. 
Now, the minute you can get people to believe that in their hearts and confess it with their mouth, it's the simplest thing in the world to get folks healed. But see, they're not believing what the Scripture said, because if by whose stripes ye were healed, that's past tense. That means in the mind of God, we were healed way back there when the stripes were laid on the back of Jesus. Well, we got to go to thinking like God thinks and believing like God believes and talking like God talks. Amen? And I've seen folks, I've seen people couldn't walk a step. Now, we believe in laying on of hands, that's scriptural. We believe in anointing with oil, that's scriptural. We believe in gifts of the Spirit and operation, we see them, that's scriptural. But some of the greatest healings I've ever seen, I, I, I never laid hands on them. I didn't have any gifts of the Spirit operating. I, I didn't minister with any special healing anointing like I do sometimes. And, and yet here's a person, the medical side, doctors had said, the best doctors said, uh, they'd never walk again. But bless God, in less than 10 minutes, there's a walking, jumping all over the front of the church. And all I did was just brought this scripture to them. Amen. Got them to believe. I remember they said to me with, with surprise, well, if that's true, then I was healed. If we were, I was. I said, that's what I want you to believe. Oh, I believe the Bible all right. I've, I, one lady said, I've read all of those scriptures in there, Brother Hagin. I know God promised to heal me. I don't know why he won't do it. I said, no, he didn't promise to heal you. All of those scriptures you read, they're statements of fact. They tell you something happened. He himself took your infirmities and bare your sicknesses. By whose stripes ye were healed. That's a fact. Start believing that and start confessing that. Amen. I said amen. I said amen. Now I just use that as an illustration. Anything else, anything else that the Bible says is yours, Anything else that the Bible says belongs to you. Anything else. Praise God. The Bible says that you are in Christ and he is in you. Believe it. Praise God. Amen. Start confessing it. Now we're right there. We're here in this uh, Ephesians. Let's look a little further down. You looked at seventh verse. Look at it again. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness or the remission of sins. Look at the previous verse, the sixth verse. To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted. Now notice that. Wherein He has made us accepted in the Beloved. I'm accepted because I'm in Him. He's the Beloved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I read in the Scriptures, He gives His Beloved sleep. Well, because I'm accepted, I got a hold of that verse on the bed of sickness. You see, you're sick, you can't sleep sometimes. And I sleep like a baby every night, always have. Never had, you know, never taken anything to help me sleep or anything. You see, the Word of God said, He gives His beloved sleep. Well, you see, because I'm accepted in the beloved, then I'm His beloved. He sees me as His beloved because He accepts me in Him. Can you see that? All you need to do, bless God, is take your place in Him. Know that you're in the Beloved. Find the Scripture. Say, well, where is that, Brother Hagin? Well, there's no reason me finding all of it for you. Look it up for yourself. It's in there. <laughs> this text said you're accepted in the Beloved. It says He gives His Beloved sleep. So go ahead and sleep. Belongs to you. Belongs to you. Hallelujah. Still works. Because I'm still in the Beloved. I'm still accepted in the beloved. Because I'm in the beloved, then God calls me his beloved. Hallelujah. 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 Because I'm in Christ. He sees me in Christ. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Hallelujah. In whom we have redemption. Well, did you ever ask yourself, what are we redeemed from? Like we say in our redemption series, you know. Most Christians, you ask them, most Christians say, well, we're redeemed from sin. Well, that's part of the story, but really that's not the whole story, and that's not even, the Bible doesn't even say that. Thank God we're redeemed from the hand of the enemy. We are redeemed from spiritual death, which produced sin in our lives. We are redeemed from the authority of Satan, the devil. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? Spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. 
Hallelujah. You could go back to Deuteronomy 28 chapter and read all about the curses. But I'm not under the curse. I'm not under the curse. Hallelujah. Now why? Because I've been redeemed. I've been redeemed. Now let's go back again in conclusion to 2 Corinthians 5. We've been looking at 17. Now we're going a little further. We're going into 18 first. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now look at verse 18. And all things are of God. Now that's a little misleading. If you take that out of the text, that all things are of God. Then you say, well, everything's of God then. Amen. Then all the beer joints are of God. All the pornographic holes are of God. No, no. Another translation said all of these things, these things he's been talking about, the new creation, old things passing away, all things becoming new, all of these things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Most folks don't even know what the ministry that's given unto them. Now notice, he has reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now he's already done it. He's not going to do it. He's already done it. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the ministry that we should have. Now you look at the 19th verse. Look at the 19th verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Do you wear your shouting clothes? To wit, see he's summing it up now. I'm reading the King James translation first. That God was in Christ reconciling. See, in the f- previous verse he said, God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, in other words, this is it. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now let me read the Amplified Translation. I'll see for sure whether you wore your shouting clothes or not. Here's the Amplified Translation of this 19th verse. It was God personally present in Christ reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. Woo! (laughs) And that's the word that we ought to took to them. God was in Christ, reconciling and restoring you. That old sinner, that prostitute, did you know you were in favor with God? No, we went out and said, you better repent and get right with God. Amen. Let's read it again. It was God personally present in Christ. This is still one of them in Christ scriptures, you know. Reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. Cancel them. He's already canceled them. He's not going to cancel them. He's already canceled them. But somebody said they'll all be saved then, won't they? No, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You've only got the sinner problem. You've got to get him to Jesus. And has committed to us, committed to us, the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? Amplified said, of the restoration to favor. He's committed to us the ministry to take to them that the world is restored to favor with God and that he's not counting up. Well, we used to sing this an old account long ago. I was always sinning. It's always growing. No, it wasn't. It's canceled out. I said it's canceled out. Not counting up. That's what he imputing King James said a little blind to us, but you accountants understand that. Imputing is an accounting term. Not counting up. It was God personally present. I like that. In Jesus Christ, reconciling or restoring the world to favor, they think they're in his disfavor. No, to favor with himself. 
He's not imputing, not counting up, or holding against men their trespasses. Well, somebody said we'll all be saved then, won't we? No, they must lay hold of that reconciliation. They must become born again because their natures are all wrong. Amen? Amen. Not counting up. Oh, that's in the Bible. What are you going to do with it? Well, that's different than what I've been taught. Well, you better get on God's bandwagon then. Not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. When did he cancel them? 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Glory to God. 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 All of that belongs to me because I'm in Christ. Hallelujah. 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 For more information about Kenneth Hagen Ministry,